All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here today. My name is Gretchen Xiao, case counsel at the AIAC, and I shall be your moderator for today's evening talk. Now, it gives us tremendous pleasure to welcome all of you to our evening talk today entitled Joint Venture Arbitrations, Your Divorce, Your Way, and More. Now, today evening, today's evening talk will run from present until 7 p.m., starting with a discussion on joint venture arbitrations, followed with a quick fire discussion on some rather light-hearted topics related to international arbitral practice post-COVID-19. And participants are welcome to ask questions during the talk, or alternatively, you may reserve your questions and have them addressed by our speakers during our 15 minutes Q&A at the end of the uh, evening talk. So after that, we shall conclude our evening talk with a networking session. Now let us kickstart the event by introducing you to our speakers for today's session. We have Mr. Roderick Kodara on our far right, Mr. Casey Lai in the middle, and last but not least, we have Ms. Sharon Chung. Now starting from Roderick, Roderick is a leading counsel or a silk lawyer, in other words, a QC, in the UK and Australia, and has an international practice, both in commercial and investor state arbitration. Now he has substantial experience sitting as a sole, chair, and co-arbitrator internationally. He has frequently appeared before the courts of the United Kingdom, the European Court of Justice, the Singapore International Commercial Court, and the state and federal courts of Australia. Roderick's arbitration practice focuses in particular on disputes, both private law and treaty-based relating to the oil and gas, power generation, and renewable re sectors, principally in Asia, UK offshore, and East and West Africa. He has acted in energy-related disputes in relation to fields in Central Asia, India, Africa, the Far East, and the UK offshore. He has also great experience in shipping and ship construction disputes involving shipyards from Asia to Europe and vessels from super luxury yachts and warship to bulk carriers. Now moving to KC in the middle. Casey Lai is an independent arbitrator and counsel with more than 20 years of experience in dispute resolution. Now he began his practice as a commercial litigator at the Singapore Bar and later spent many years leading the disputes department of a major international law firm in Singapore. Now he's a fellow of the Singapore Institute of Arbitrators and is one of the panel of the arbitrators of the AIAC and SIAC. KC specializes on international arbitration and has been involved in a wide variety of high value disputes in Southeast Asia from a range of industry sectors, including energy, infrastructure, oil and gas, aviation, and commercial fraud. He has received appointments both as sole arbitrator and as part of a panel in commercial cases centered in Japan, India, China, the Philippines, and Rwanda. KC is highly regarded by his peers as cl and clients and has been named in the Hall of Fame for International Arbitration Legal 500. Now, last but not least, we have Sharon over here. Now, Sharon is a dispute resolution partner and her portfolio focuses on aviation disputes, international arbitration, corporate and commercial litigation and arbitration, and insolvency and restructuring. She acts as an advocate in a wide array of cross-border disputes and has appeared at all tiers of the Malaysian courts and in international arbitrations in Asia and Europe. Her other areas of practice include regulatory enforcement, competition disputes, and oil and gas disputes. Now, in addition, Sharon sits as an arbitrator and is a panel member of AIAC, SIAC, HKIAC, KCAB, and THAC. In 2017, she was appointed to the ad hoc arbitration panel for the 29 Southeast Asian Games, Kuala Lumpur 2017. Now in 2021, Sharon was recognized as one of ALB's Asia Top 15 Rising Lawyers and was awarded Young Lawyer of the Year at ALB Malaysia Law Awards 2020. She's ranked as quote unquote, next generation partner for dispute resolution in the legal 500 Asia Pacific 2020 to 2022. Now without further ado, let us kickstart our evening talk. I think we shall begin with Roderick. Now, by way of an introduction, can you tell us briefly what exactly is a joint venture agreement? Roderick, the floor is yours. Gresham, thank you very much. And may I say what a pleasure it is to be back in KL after too long an absence and to be addressing this 
uh, august audience alongside my very distinguished uh, co-panelists. The question, uh, what is a joint venture? The answer is, of course, that we are in elephant territory. The definition is difficult, but the recognition is relatively easy. The common law world does not have any statutory or general or formalized definition of a joint venture. Civil law world, similarly, although, as I'll say in a moment, it does perhaps have a slightly more detailed view of what makes a joint venture. In China, as I understand it, certain forms of joint venture need to be registered. And uh, in particular, there's a format for uh, joint ventures in the telecoms industry. Beyond that, I cannot go. But coming back to the question, well, what, what is a joint venture? Like an elephant, we can identify certain characteristics which must be present. But unlike an elephant, uh, the edges shade off into other forms of relationship. In terms of the characteristics that must be present, in my view, first characteristic, a degree of long-term relationship, long-term uh, working together, and of course, many of the problems start from, from that, and we'll get back to those. Secondly, the exploitation of an asset or an opportunity uh, is very frequently at the core of that long-term relationship. It might be an opportunity not yet confirmed. The sort of joint ventures that I have frequently seen over the years in the energy industry, upstream oil and gas, joint ventures uh, where parties come together and pool their resources in order to explore, to explore for oil and gas. That's a classic. Or one might have a situation in which the asset or the opportunity is a concession uh, in a country or a freshly built luxury hotel uh, in search of a management company to come and manage it. So long term, some asset, an opportunity, real or imagined. Uh, and thirdly, often, uh, but not always, different skill sets between the parties. So one party may be uh, in uh, possession of the asset, but another party has the skills to exploit it or can form relationships with those who have the skills. So returning to the hotel situation, that would be one perhaps of those internationally well-known management companies who, uh, when there's a freshly built hotel, as you know, come and tender to the owners for the task of managing the hotel. In the oil and gas industry, uh, you will have joint venture parties. One of them will be the operator, magic status. And that may be because they have the intrinsic skills in-house or they can get uh, uh, the best possible access to those who can explore and, and deal with those issues and, and so forth. So long-term asset opportunity exploitation, differing skills. Those I think are the three critical factors. There can be, this is a fourth factor, elements of the provision of services with it, between the two, and it might be two and it might be more than two parties. Uh, hotel example is a good one there. However, uh, rapidly that can shade off into simply a long-term service contract. For example, uh, if uh, IBM come and agree a 10-year uh, package with a bank to deal with all their mainframe and other computing uh, needs, that would be a classic example, uh, not of a joint venture, but of something which has many of the characteristics. Um, the, the various forms, this is the last but one point I will make, the various forms that it can take, um, somewhere there is always a contract. Sometimes that will simply be a contract between the two parties, the energy example, 
and the disputes will ultimately turn on that contract. Uh, sometimes they will actually form a joint venture corporate vehicle in which they will take shares, but there will always be a shareholders agreement behind that. So that's where the contract will be found. There is an extra layer of complication, particularly unraveling, if the parties have decided to go for a corporate vehicle in which they both have shares, but it's the corporate vehicle that carries out the joint venture. And we'll come back to, to those. What, one point is suddenly you have introduced uh, company law, corporate law, into the relationship, and that can sometimes be a serious problem when it comes to working out whether you go to arbitration or to court uh, or to both. The very last point is that, of course, there is very frequently a cross-border element, uh, and we will come back to that as well, but that brings with it the questions of jurisdiction, where will the parties be happiest to have their dispute settled, uh, and, and that's a, a whole uh, subset of the discussion in itself. Gresham, thank you. That's my attempt at an answer. Thank you, Roderick, um, in providing us the premise. Now, moving on to uh, Casey, perhaps, if we would share in your experience, um, what was the common cause of disputes in joint venture? Well, uh, I think you'll help if I just set out uh, what are the sort of joint ventures which uh, I uh, have a ex experience with. And when I um, started out in international arbitration over uh, 20 years ago, uh, the sort of joint ventures which got into trouble and ended up in arbitration, they were almost always joint ventures uh, where one party was American or European and then the, the other party was an Asian party and the joint venture involved doing business in Asia. It, it was almost inevitably like that, uh, let's say 20 years ago. Today, uh, that's changed a lot. And the uh, usual profile of a joint venture that's gone wrong, which ends up in arbitrations that I see, uh, it's two Asian parties uh, doing a joint venture, uh, which involves doing business in either a third Asian country or in one of the, uh, in the, in the countries of one of the uh, parties. So that's the kind of joint venture uh, I'm talking about. Uh, common causes. I think the easiest way um, that I found to understand it uh, is a joint venture of this type uh, is really like a marriage, right? And when you sign a joint venture agreement, it's like you're getting married, right? Very few people uh, get married uh, with the intention of getting divorced. Uh, if you uh, if you already made up your divorce, you probably wouldn't have gotten married in the first place. So certainly at the start of the joint venture, mo usually the two parties are, shall we say, well motivated. They think this thing is going to work out. Uh, what commonly causes uh, disputes, I think, again, we go back to it. It's like marriage. Uh, it's one of two things, usually. Uh, number one, uh, the two parties had different expectations from day one. They just didn't discover it yet at the point that they signed uh, the joint venture agreement. Uh, and uh, number two, everything was fine on day one. Uh, but as the joint venture went on, something happened, uh, which the two of them hadn't thought about you know, uh, at the start. Uh, and the relationship was not able to, uh, to deal with this uh, thing uh, happening. Now, of course, by the time it's so bad that the two parties are now uh, in an arbitration, right, uh, suing uh, each other, uh, they would be in disagreement about just about everything. Yeah. Um, but again, back to the divorce courts, actually, it's quite suitable we're here. This, these, these were the Sharia courts, right? Um, and if you ever looked at the particulars of complaint in a divorce petition, shall we say some of the individual complaints are starting to get extremely uh, uh, petty, okay? And the truth is, if the parties still had a working relationship, all this stuff could have been 
could have been settled. But the the reason why you know they're they're in arbitration now is because the relationship has uh, has broken uh, uh, down. And uh, so when we say what's the the cause of it, it, it we're really looking for a cause of the relationship breaking down, uh, and it's one of those two reasons. Thank you, Casey. And that was some great marital relationship advice as well. Now, moving on to Sharon then. Now, what are litigants in joint venture arbitration typically looking to get out of in the arbitral process? Um, thanks, Gretchen, for the question. Um, I think ultimately, just like in all arbitrations, um, litigants are looking for, um, to have their, their disputes resolved, that's one, and to have an enforceable award. Um, Really, that's you know ultimately what they're looking for. Um, of course, there are other um, there are other factors or other reasons why they would um, choose to have their disputes arbitrated uh, as as opposed to litigated, um, which is the confidentiality factor. And and we're looking at uh, potentially two stages of our disputes here. We are we are looking at the pre-closing and uh, post-closing. So the closer parties are, or the closer the disputes are, or the earlier the disputes happen, um, the more important it is for parties to be able to arbitrate the disputes in, in a confidential setting. Because this is, you know, at a time when, you know, if giving, uh, taking the analogy of a, a marriage, um, you know, you have just, you know, gotten married, you've just signed uh, your registration, um, your marriage uh, certificate, you've just gotten it. And, and you know you, you see some some problems brewing and you want to resolve that in a confidential setting you don't want anybody else to know especially your family right or, or your in-laws um, so you don't want anyone to know and you want that to be to be able to, to re resolve in a confidential setting so that's really um, you know uh, one of the main reasons why joint venture um, disputes end up in in, in arbitration. And the other, of course, is enforceability of the award. And you want to be able to, you know, take whatever award that is that you obtain through, you know, from the proceedings, to be able to enforce it in any of the New York Convention states, All right? So, um, and if we're looking at um, international um, joint venture um, agreements between parties of different uh, states, that's really um, what parties are looking for. Because you are not able to, you, you know, you don't want to have the hassle of, um, you know, trying to find out whether, you know, you know, you don't, you don't want to have to go to the courts um, of of any uh, of a, of a place where, you know, you are not sure whether your disputes would be uh, litigated in the manner that you are comfortable with, and so on. So really, um, I would say two things: um, to have your disputes uh, resolved uh, in a confidential setting, um, and two, to have your um, to have the parties um, award um, enforced in in a simple way um, and and a, and a quick uh, and speedy way. Of course, uh, well we know that um, once um, um, counsel and lawyers get involved, um, there may be um, circumstances where you know your your and your your simple setting your simple enforcement of award may you know be dragged out to for years and you know you end up going up to to the appeal courts and so on. But but that's that's for another day. So really, parties are looking uh, for an enforceable award. Right. Thank you, Sharon. So building up on um, Sharon's response just now, Roderick, so is arbitration necessarily a better way to resolve joint venture disputes as opposed to litigation? The, the answer is it's not necessarily a better way, but it, in my opinion, it is generally a better way. I can envisage situation when things have gone so badly wrong that one party just wants to issue proceedings in the high court with maximum prejudice and publicity uh, and uh, thereafter drag the other party, it is beginning to sound like divorce proceedings, uh, through a highly publicized and salacious and uh, well, well documented uh, nightmare. I haven't mercifully had that experience. My, my clients, I think like everybody's clients, although they can get upset at the end of the day, all they want is the money. And that is a very uh, uh, comforting factor, just the money. Um, 
Of course, every lawyer is delighted when he or she hears the words, I'm suing as a matter of principle. But I don't see those people very much anymore. So um, w what then uh, makes arbitration generally a better course? It, a lot of the obvious reasons, and uh, we've already heard at high level what those might be, but let, let's lift the bonnet and look at the, the process itself. Uh, it is it is as neutral as you can ever hope for. I say that because thinking as as I do and what I tend to see across border cases, not not always, but often, there is there is the fear um, of um, the home court system uh, of the other side, which inevitably is there. Uh, and a party will not want to litigate in a strange place with a strange system, knowing that the other side is at home and may have relationships uh, with the legal profession and, and indeed even the judiciary, which will be helpful. So the, the first thing that it delivers is neutrality or as much neutrality as human beings are capable of because inevitably uh, the arbitral panel will come with its own prejudices but that's that's a fact of life uh, within that of course a party wants as much bias in its own favor as it can legitimately orchestrate and that comes in the identification of quotes your arbitrator i speak of course uh, <clears throat> of panels of three uh, but this problem is even more acute where it's a soul that has to be nominated so uh, particularly in the larger cases or the investor state cases, huge amounts of effort goes in to um, tracking the lifetime experience of the arbitrator. Uh, what has he or she written uh, and what is known about earlier uh, rulings and decisions? What did they do if, if for example, they retired judge? What, what did they do when they were at the bar and so on and so forth? I think it's largely a waste of time, I have to say, because once people get into the arbitral chair, uh, they um, focus on the issues. And uh, I certainly think that the sort of inquiries that are often made are largely therapeutic for the benefit of the party appointing. <laughs> However, that's part of the package. So you get neutrality, but then hopefully you can create a little enclave of bias in your favor by choosing someone who you think will be congenial. Flexibility uh, is uh, something that is uh, often mentioned. Uh, and <clears throat> I think depending on the legal system, arbitral processes can be more flexible uh, than court. That said, in many countries, uh, I think of Singapore and I think of uh, the UK, both of which I know best, I'd be interested to hear comments about about Malaysia, uh, the commercial court system is highly imaginative, energetic, and and quite flexible. But I think overall, there is an added degree of flexibility uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, the arbitration process. Hours can be longer than court hours. People be, can be convened more quickly. As long, of course, as you're careful when you're making your inquiries of the arbitrator, to find out how many arbitrations they are already sitting in. Because suddenly you may find that one or more of the arbitrators has a list of cases, which means that they can't actually hear the matter for a couple of years. So that's, that's important. Uh, Non-coercive <clears throat> powers, this is an odd point. Arbitrators obviously don't have the force of the state behind them, uh, and they can't commit anyone to prison. It's a fact, perhaps, for which one should be grateful sometimes. Uh, but it means that uh, if one gets into a situation, which I think we will be discussing, where you've got uh, mandatory orders which are then broken, uh, if there is to be uh, any unpleasantness inflicted on the delinquent party, it's not done within the arbitral process that goes off to the courts. So it puts it a little bit of a distance. 
hopefully that never happens, but uh, it's something that is, uh, is to be noted. Uh, last two or three points. Uh, Shams already mentioned enforceability, and so that's, that, that's one. Um, tiered dispute clauses, we may well come back to this. So you, you ratchet up, uh, first of all, negotiation, uh, then perhaps mediation or an expert, uh, uh, and only after that uh, do you actually go into um, uh, battle mode in terms of, of proceedings. I haven't seen a tiered clause which ends with courts. It tends to be once you're in the tiered clauses, you end in arbitration. It'd be interesting to have a tiered clause that ends in courts. Uh, I don't think they exist. Uh, so those, in my view, are the advantages. Uh, I, I, just one more to add. In cross-border cases, by definition, it's a point I've already made, you avoid one side or the other having to play an away game in a judicial uh, setting, which is not theirs. Uh, you can generally and do generally find yourself in a cross-border case in a third place or in a third system. Thank you, Roderick. Now, moving on to KC, perhaps, um, what is your key advice to parties or councils in crafting a joint venture agreement? What are the typical clauses which should be drafted in better clarity for avoidance of doubt or uncertainty? Well, I think uh, in the uh classic subtle lawyer way, uh, I would say different things to different people. Right? Uh, so we're, we're talking about a situation where we haven't gotten married yet. <clears throat> we're working on the marriage contract and, I, and I'm called in at that point. Uh, if I was advising the M&A lawyers who were doing it, uh, my advice is, uh, can you please call your dispute people in and just explain to them uh, what this deal is about and listen to what your dispute guys uh, have to say, right? Uh, because uh, the, the, uh, the dispute guys probably because of their experience can tell you what are going to be the likely friction points uh, in, in, the, in this deal. And maybe the M&A guys want to be super careful about drafting uh, around these uh, friction points. And certainly, um, when I worked for uh, an international firm, uh, the corporate guys would call me in on exactly that reason. You know, I give them half an hour of my time. I tell them, well, this is where it will fail. And then they, they, they go off. Uh, but not all law firms, I think, um, are so well integrated between, uh, you know, the, the corporate guys and uh, the dispute guys. And, and certainly in, in a traditional law firm, uh, you hear this phrase that, oh, the file migrated down the corridor to litigation, uh, which suggests that litigation never got near this file until it was ir irretrievably broken down. And then it makes a ceremonial journey down the corridor from which you will never return. You know, <laughs> right? it's a one way journey. Right. Um, so that's what I would say to the uh, M&A lawyers. Now, what about the parties? If um, we were in that sort of situation, which I said was very classic 20 years ago. You, 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 one of the JV partners is American or European, and, and the other JV partner is Asian. Uh, I would say to the American or European party, especially if they were Americans, uh, I would say, please don't place all your faith in the wording of the contract, uh, because you know, whether this JV is going to uh, actually work out or not uh, doesn't depend solely on whether you got the wording of the contract uh, uh, right or not. Uh, you should be spending some of your resources actually playing out what's going to happen uh, once the JV gets going, who will have power uh, over the life of this uh, JV. Uh, and then I would say to the Asian joint venture party, the exact opposite. Uh, I would say, look, I know you guys, uh, and the Americans spend all their money on lawyers, uh, and you guys, I know what you're paying your transactional lawyers, not much, so <laughs> you're not spending your money on lawyers, you're spending your money on relationships, 
And I know you guys, you're betting that it doesn't really matter what I sign because five years down the line, I'm going to be able to do all these things and the other chap either won't find out or won't be in a position to complain. Uh, and my advice to you is, that's, I mean, it does actually matter what the contract says. Uh, so maybe you, you know, you want to actually pay some money for a lawyer to look at it uh, and, and get it right because it, it, it will cost you, you know, in the end. Uh, this, this game plan of yours uh, doesn't always work. So in summary, that's what I would say. Thank you, Casey. Now, um, extending on crafting joint ventures agreements, right? So Sharon, what are the factors considered by um, the parties in deciding the governing law of the joint venture agreement? Um, I think generally the factors, are, I mean, the first one would be um, where I suppose the contract is to be substantially performed um, and or, or the law most co closely connected to the joint venture. Um, in particular, you know, if, if there is a joint venture vehicle that has to be incorporated. Um, considerations of uh, local laws, um, tax, especially tax um, and regulations um, are also critical um, um, when, when considering um, the governing law of the contract. Um, parties may also choose a neutral jurisdiction whose laws and rules um, for contractual interpretation are well developed. You know, you could use um, uh, perhaps the English law for, for the for the jurisdictions, the, the Commonwealth um, jurisdictions. You know, we are we're all very well versed with um, English law. Perhaps that could be a good um, neutral um, governing law that parties may 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 may, may consider. Um, but for this, I think experience and familiarity with the with the laws um, is key. Um, you know. And, and this is where I think um, uh, parties should always, um, you know, get get um, advice, proper advice before they, they, you know, decide to pick a governing law of the contract. I, I have seen um, contracts where parties just kind of just go around, look at a map and say, oh, well, let's maybe let's look at, um, you know, use this, um, uh, use this uh, law as the governing law of the contract. I mean, it doesn't happen um, uh, in, in, in agreements involving sophisticated parties, uh, but certainly um, where, where they're less um, knowledgeable in, in, in what goes into the whole process of uh, arbitration. Um, there should also be some consistency between the law uh, governing the contract and the seat of arbitration um, and, and or the forum, uh, forum or the seat that, that, that you are, that you have uh, selected. Uh, while we are on the subject of governing law of the contract, um, parties may also wish to pre-agree on the law governing the arbitration agreement. Um, this is something that has really come up um, in, in the last couple of years, um, you know, where parties, it, it's not something that we often see in, in an agreement. We always see um, parties agreeing on the law governing the contract, so the substantive law of the contract, but not the, the governing law of the arbitration agreement. And there have been a, quite a number of cases on this um, as to, you know, how do you then determine what is the law governing the arbitration agreement? Um, and, and we have seen in, in, in the last one or two years, um, uh, cases that have come out of this, and most recently, um, the Supreme, UK Supreme Court case of Enka and Chubb, um, where, where the courts have clarified, the, the Supreme Court had clarified that um, the starting point uh, would be um, the law governing, so the law governing the arbitration agreement should follow the law governing the contract um, in the absence of, um, you know, parties pre-agreement on, on this. Um, so, so this, so, so then that leads um, us to the question, if you don't have a law governing the contract, then it makes it even more difficult. So you have, you know, two levels of uh, difficulty. You have to first decide, or, or the, you have to go to court, um, you know, for, for determination on what is the law governing the contract, and then decide on what it, the law governing the arbitration agreement is. Um, so that's something that um, uh, parties should always look out for. And, and that's why a uh, law governing um, contract is, is, is very important. Thank you, Sharon. Now, rounding back to uh, Roderick now. So as an arbitrator, how do you respond to a joint venture dispute where the wording of the joint venture ag agreement is inadequate or not reflective of how the parties operate the joint venture agreement? Thank you, Gretchen. 
what one temptation which never happens in practice but might be salutary is to have all the draftsmen in the room have them separately represented and shout at them a lot and that's just a fantasy answer but uh it's it's clear that commercial law has been around for long enough for people to surely have learned the lessons of clarity and specificity which are necessary but that was an easy jibe the fact is that everything will turn on what sort of a joint venture it is if it's an energy related matter the tram lines of performance are very clearly set out uh, geologists tests decision making of course there's judgment involved as to whether or not to uh, carry on or to exploit uh, but it's an area where uh, the process is well known there's no particular mystery go to my favorite example of hotel management and we all know that there is a mystique there is something intangible about managing a hotel well about advertising the hotel judging the market having the right general manager uh, having a a great chef rather than merely a good chef etc and it's very difficult in that kind of case where just to go back to what i said at the beginning you've got the asset or the opportunity brought by one party and then you've got the skills brought by another party it's very difficult to be highly prescriptive uh, in another situation i've touched on this in terms of computing less of a joint venture more more of a service contract but in long term a provision of computing one has schedules kpis uh, 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 and then schedules within the schedules of uh, exactly uh, what must happen at what level of intensity etc so before perhaps one shouts too much at the drafts people uh, one has to recognize these various differing levels of subtlety. One possibility is that the parties have linked uh, adequacy of performance to financial outcome. So, uh, for example, in the case of the hotel, uh, certain returns have been specified or uh, are specified, not necessarily required, but before the fee income of the manager will hit a new level there has to be a particular return uh, but that again isn't isn't always possible so one comes to the practicality one is in the arbitration room sitting as an arbitrator and it becomes painfully obvious that the contract really doesn't reflect the agreement uh, temptation number one is to remake the agreement in a fair way and that's a very human judicial arbitral temptation and it's hard to resist but it really you really must resist it as far as possible because the parties had their moment they had whatever the knowledge was that they had about the story when they made the contract secondly they had their respective bargaining powers and positions interestingly one thing i didn't mention in my first of my comments was that the french add a further factor to the definition of a joint venture which is the parties are of broadly equal economic standing i, I don't agree with that i mean often it's the case but it's not necessarily the case and if five years after the contract was made, a well-meaning arbitrator comes onto the scene, sees that the agreement is really not, not very well put together, the temptation is with hindsight and with perhaps his or her culture, uh, which might be a very British, um, it's not cricket type culture insofar as that uh, still exists, uh, they might make a fresh contract which is nothing like the contract which the parties uh, would have made or in fact did make so one has to be a bit hard 
parted. And one has to look at the deal they made. If that deal was performed in a way that was different from what the contract said, things are much easier because clearly if they've drifted into a different sort of performance, that's what they wanted. And, and therefore one might well reach for concepts such as a stop or buy convention and say, okay, the contract was to deliver bananas, but everyone delivered apples. Therefore, uh, the parties effectively consented to an amendment to, to what the contract was about. But um, all of these factors uh, will be in play. And I think in, in overall terms, one has to try that most impossible of things and put oneself back into that world where they made the contract. Uh, and um, deliver as far as you can, and it may not be that far, a definition of the obligations that they owe to each other, uh, which reflects that world. You rapidly perhaps run out of road as an arbitrator, in which case you put your mental pen down. Um, you're not there to solve the problems of the world. You are there to decide that case. I've been talking about duties up to now, but of course, um, there are remedies. Remedies are much easier. The, the law uh, gives us all a palette of remedies, damages, specific performance, injunctions, declarations. We're all familiar with those. And uh, sometimes it's helpful. The contract, shipbuilding contracts are classic. They are highly prescriptive of the remedies uh, in a variety of situations, to the point where general damages are excluded. Uh, and if it's the ship owner who's walked away at the wrong moment, there's a cascade uh, of payments and credits and debits, uh, usually ending with the sale of the ship to some someone else. Uh, and if the yard uh, has um, uh, is in breach, there's a different cascade. Um, but uh, the real problem, the real challenge, as I've said, is in the definition of duties where the contract has been vague. Last point, often at that euphoric uh, wedding breakfast moment, the parties have not defined the duties and the manner of delivery of the duties in as detailed a way as later it, it, sh it is shown they should have done. It's too high level, it's too aspirational, but as I have already said, that's, what they de decided, and one has to try very, very consciously to work within within that, even if the outcome, with uh, the benefit of hindsight, might seem unfair. Thank you, Roderick, for the uh, perspective. Now, Casey, is there a difference in dynamic between joint ventures between parties from the same culture and joint ventures between parties from different cultures? Well, uh, I think the short answer is yes, uh, but expanding it gets a bit complicated. Um, let, let, I think I'm just going to make uh, uh, two points. Uh, the first is if, if, if I was uh, an arbitrator, uh, very often in joint ventures, uh, there are two questions which uh, pop up, which is uh, number one, uh, can the tribunal believe that the parties wrote one thing in the contract and then right after that they went and did something completely different? Uh, you know, is the tribunal willing to, to believe this? Um, and in my experience, I'm less willing to believe that if one of the parties was American or, or, or European. I'm more willing to believe it if everybody in this show uh, is, is, is Asian, okay? Uh, so that's one difference. And then the, the second sort of thing that comes up is this. Is the tribunal willing to believe that a, a, an issue that was clearly going to be very important to this joint venture is not addressed in the contract at all? And if it's not addressed in the contract, then what are we supposed to infer? Are we supposed to infer that there's no agreement on it? Because, you know, one allegedly logical thing to say is uh, if it was important to the parties, they would have written it. 
And so you can infer that if they didn't write it, it wasn't important to them and they didn't think about it. So to what extent are you willing to follow, you know, this kind of uh, uh, reasoning? And again, I think if, if one of the joint venture parties was American or, or European, I, 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 I would have difficulty uh, uh, believing that if it was important, that they, 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 didn't, they didn't write anything. If both parties were Asian, uh, I, I'm more willing to believe it. Um, I, I know a Korean arbitrator um, who told me this is how he tried to he he tries to explain it to his fellow uh, arbitrators, okay, uh, if they're on a panel together, and he explains it like this. He says, "Look, think of a dragon. You know, uh, a Western dragon always has got wings. That's how you know a dragon can fly. But an Oriental dragon doesn't have wings." But everybody believes it can fly. Um, and, and so we, we have difference. You know, you, you have a culture that believes, uh, in order for me to believe a dragon can fly, it must have wings. If somebody didn't draw wings, it means it cannot fly. And then there's another culture which says, why does it need to have wings? Of course it can fly. Everybody knows it can fly. You know? uh, and so I, it may not be the, the best way of explaining it, but I thought that was an interesting way of... Uh, of uh, looking at it. But certainly, I think those of us in practice who have lots of Asian clients, at least in the private meetings with the clients, the, the clients will say, as far as I can tell, very genuinely, you know, the other side knows what the deal was. They'll say very meaningfully, you know, he knows what he should do, you know. And perhaps in a more marital uh, sort of uh, direction, he knows what he did, you know, uh, and uh, sort of leave the rest to be inferred. But I think uh, it happens often enough that uh, I, I suspect at least part of it is is genuine. Yeah. Excellent analogy, Casey. Now, um, Roderick mentioned about uh, tea dispute resolution. So, Sharon, in resolving joint venture conflicts. Are parties inclined to first undergo mediation before resorting to arbitration? If so, how effective does mediation negate the need for a joint venture arbitration? Um, thanks, Gretchen. I think in recent years, I've noticed um, a, a trend uh, where parties tend to favor the inclusion of uh, mandatory uh, consultation periods or, or tiered dispute clauses. Um, and and they and they prefer to stipulate an an obligation to elevate disputes to senior management uh, before a party is able to commence formal legal proceedings. Um, there is of course a very uh, good logical reason for this. Um, you know, where senior management of parties may be in a better position to resolve the the disagreement amicably, where perhaps they may have more information, uh, more commercial information. Um, they may have a wider range of solutions um, and, of course, mandate um, available to them compared to the working level uh, who, will, who would have um, been dealing with each other on a regular basis. Um, the, I, I think the primary value of having a tiered dispute resolution clause is that it puts, it, it puts ADR on the agenda. It puts mediation, it puts um, good faith negotiations on the agenda. Well, it's not to say that uh, parties are not at liberty to 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 go to opt for mediation or to to enter into good faith negotiations. You know, if if there was no tier dispute resolution, but really it 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 gives it, it reminds parties that hey, you know, you 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 probably should try and 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 get this sorted out. In fact, you have to um, get this um, at least try and attempt to to resolve the matter uh, amicably. So the, the, the value, I think, um, in, in this tier dispute resolution is it puts it on the agenda. Um, some parties may consider it, um, um, and, and to add on to this, um, some parties may, may think that, oh, if I'm the party, you know, uh, but for a, a tier dispute clause, um, if I was a party to, to suggest uh, a mediation or, or, or good faith negotiation, uh, first, then it may be a sign of weakness, you know, on on my part, and and, and so on. So so it really helps uh, put that on the agenda. Um, however, I think, um, well, my personal view is that um, it does sometimes um, become an obstacle um, to to going straight for arbitration or litigation, if you will. 
um, you know, without having to go through all these processes. And, and really, I think, um, taking the words of uh, Casey earlier, uh, it depends on who you speak to. So if you speak to the party that is commencing the claim, then really you, you look at this as you know, an obstacle, an added you know, step to, be, to, to take. And, and, and it, may, you know, it may hold up things, it may, it may, you, know, you, you have to wait another 30 days or, 40, or, or 90 days before you can actually commence your legal claim. So if you're at a party commencing the claim, you may not want it at the end of the day when the dispute actually arrives. But if you're on the other side, um, you know, expecting to, to respond to a claim, you may, you may actually welcome it. So I think ultimately, really, you know, it, I, I, I personally feel that it may not always um, be the best uh, way to go. And it really depends on how, um, how the agreement is structured and who are the people working on the agreement and whether there would be, and, and, the, culture of, and the culture of the two parties. Um, if we're looking at uh, parties from, from similar culture where, or, or the Asian culture where they feel that, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to be the, you know, we don't want to have to suggest or, or propose um, good faith negotiations or mediation because it's a sign of weakness on our part. Then really having a tiered dispute resolution clause would be very, will be extremely helpful. And in fact, it may work because you would, you would force parties or compel parties to sit together and, and to then try and work it out. Um, so, so it's really a phase issue, right? So with um, Asians, I suppose um, there may be a bit more of a, an incentive um, to to have this in in the um, in the agreement. Um, so otherwise, I think um, you know having an, a mandatory process uh, for tiered dispute clauses may not always be effective. Thank you so much, Sharon. Now, thank you, speakers, for your comprehensive and succinct thoughts on this rather heavy topic, we would say. Now, however, due to time exigencies, let us segue into the second part, or rather the dessert of our evening talk, which consists of three rounds of quick fire discussion. Now, without further ado, let's jump into round one. The fashion of arbitration, whatever does one wear. Now, conducting hearings online is becoming more and more common especially since the outbreak of COVID-19. Is the choice of clothing in virtual hearings as important as it is when it comes to a physical hearing? Roderick, do you want to take this one? Yes, with pleasure. Um, this is a minefield. <laughs> so let me tell you straight away, I am not going to speak about the ladies, okay? Because there's no way back for a man if he starts to do that. Secondly, above the waist only. Whatever you do below the waist is your affair. I'm not going there. There has been some discussion uh, in the course of the preparation for today uh, about wearing shoes or not wearing shoes while addressing the arbitral panel. And that exposed a very interesting Asian European distinction, because of course, Asians don't wear shoes in their homes. Whereas as we know, Europeans grubby folk that they are, they clump about in their muddy Wellington boots all over their carpets in their dining rooms. I should say just to give context that when I was locked down as we all were in, in our various situations, I had a rigorous internal domestic rule I did arbitrations from the kitchen and court from the dining room. I think it's important to maintain standards. As far as, therefore, I address now the men in the audience, um, please wear a tie. Uh, it is really not quite the done thing to address a tribunal uh, with an open neck. Uh, particularly if there's jewelry hanging around that open neck. It will be a distraction. Um, footnote, not talking about clothes, but of course, the, the, the well-known question of the background. Uh, I, for a long time, made the mistake of, of having not having any form of virtual background. And it, it was actually mo more interesting to the listeners to look over my shoulder 
uh, at the flower display or the photographs than, and I can't blame them for this, than listen to what I was actually saying. Um, so uh, wear a tie, I believe. I also have a rule which I apply in the real world, as it were. I never cross-examine without a jacket on. It's weird. I think it's one of those little totems that one does just to give oneself a feeling, uh, a feeling of um, reassurance. Um, it, the uh, the question uh, in, in non-virtual contexts, just to digress to that, um, uh, what if anything can one do to shock and distract uh, the tribunal, particularly if you know that that morning the other side will be cross-examining, and I think. Again, staying with the men, some over-coordinated set of ties, handkerchiefs, socks, shirts, so that you're a splash of pink. You have a pink shirt, a pink tie, pink socks, and a pink, a pink handkerchief. I've never done it myself, but I invite any of the brave fellows in this audience to try it. And certainly you, you will uh, perhaps dilute the tribunal's attention span in terms of what the other side were doing, uh, especially if you fiddle around with the handkerchief and blow your nose very noisily on the pink handkerchief and then stuff it back in your top pocket uh, and then possibly even blow, no, 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 forget that. Um, so these are small, but I think critical tactical considerations. Well, Roderick, I'm gonna ask a follow up to that, which is how do you stand on folkloric dress, national dress exception. Brilliant. <laughs> so the, the please wear a tie doesn't apply if you, you're Indonesian council, you come in your batik, if you're Filipino, you come in your, 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 your barong, that, that sort of thing. Absolutely, and let's not even go to Nigeria. <laughs> All right, now, Staying above waist. Now, Sharon, should the disputant's choice of clothing be influenced by the nature of the proceeding, whether if it's mediation, arbitration, or even adjudication? Uh, well, I think we all know that um, mediation, arbitration, adjudication um, proceedings are not like um, the high court, uh, sorry, the, 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 the high profile courtroom drama that we see on TV, um, you know, uh, a lot. Johnny Depp and Amber Heard um, uh, trial. So certainly, um, I, I I wish I had an example of um, you know having seen someone wearing something outrageous in in a mediation or arbitration proceeding. But unfortunately, I don't have an example of that. Um, so I think really what I've seen so far is you know the boring um, well, boring. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, suits and uh, you know um, perhaps the occasional uh, loud um, ties and uh, loud shirts right um, it's just a play of colors but I've not really seen anything outrageous but I, I but I, I think you 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 would never go wrong with you know a suit and sober colors and neutral colors thank you Sharon now, Roderick mentioned about neutrality just now, and speaking of playing with colors, Casey, how important of a role does the color of someone's attire play in an arbitration proceeding? Now, does color play a role in concretizing one's quote unquote neutrality? Uh, you mean if you're the arbitrator? So we've shifted to what should the arbitrator <laughs> wear, yes. right? Uh, I think in my experience, nobody notices what the, the arbitrator wears uh, because uh, he's not doing most of the talking, right? It's all about the divorce. Yeah, I, I think it's more about the, the, the parties. Now, arbitrators now, in my experience, arbitrators almost inevitably wear suits. Uh, I can only, in all these years, think of one exception where one arbitrator turned up in... Um, in a kruta and a pair of chapals. Uh, yes, <laughs> he did it because he could. <laughs> he was senior, uh, very. Okay, but apart from that one incident, uh, I think arbitrators always wear suits. But there's a lot more variety when it comes to the, 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 
the 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 council and the two sides and uh i i've certainly had a uh, council from philippines turn up in barong council from uh, indonesia turn up in uh, uh batik shirts uh do i think what you wear is important uh yeah i do i i do think it's uh important uh i'll just make two points it uh, i mean the the a lot of people would say look i mean you know as long as you look professional it's fine right it, it it's the it's what you say that matters it, it it's not you know it's it's just not a a fashion show right uh i think these people do not understand humans hmm? and i think that statement is more aspirational it is a statement of what should be uh, rather than an observation about what is the way that i would explain it is it's background music to a movie so you know when you go to the movies i mean I, it's not a musical or something it might be some sort of action movie or or a drama movie um you never notice the background music do you hmm? but if you watch the movie or and somebody killed the background music so there is no background you would notice a uh, is absence so that that you know i think what you wear is, is really uh, you know is it important it's as important as as background music is is important and i think it's down to what's the impression that you 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 are trying to give and it may not be a simple the impression i want is that i'm neat and well organized right I, we we might well, i mean you know i i hope council takes it for granted that i accept that you're neat and organized <laughs> you might be a bit more ambitious about about, about the impression uh, you want to give so so maybe matching pink uh, you know uh, pocket pocket squares uh, uh, might might be a way to go thank you casey now um one last question for roderick before we move on to the second part now why should the last button of a suit vest always be left open uh, this is uh, a very profound and inexplicably ignored question i'm not sure um when anyone last wore a suit vest in kl or singapore uh by suit vest i mean of course a waistcoat or if you're very old fashioned a waistcoat uh, and uh, they have fallen out of favor, which is a great shame. Uh, as a young barrister, I would go to court uh, wearing a three-piece suit. Uh, it might even be that I would go to court wearing a black jacket, a black waistcoat, and uh, gray and black striped trousers. If I did do that, I would have always to remember not not on the way home to pop into uh, any kind of a formal restaurant because I would be immediately mistaken for the maitre d'. Uh, so in, in that world, and then of course, waistcoats just for three-piece suits, the British tradition is not to do up that bottom button. And the answer is like so many British traditions, it's pointless, but it enables you to tell who doesn't know the rules and that is very important in all british traditions uh, there are various things that are no longer respected for example uh kc and i both mentioned it the the pocket square the pocket handkerchief which of course everyone should have and as completely uh, has completely gone out of fashion so the the bottom button is simply one of those markers that you're either in the in the know or hoi polloi. Thank you, Roderick. Now moving on to round two. Zoom and gloom. Should you buy that O light? Now, Casey, how can practitioners, parties, and tribunals, in your opinion, make the most of the virtual hearings? What other gadgets should they have really? I, I think if you're counsel in a virtual uh, hearing that uh, you really need to get some very fussy young person to help you, uh, but you are not going to get out of this one alive 
uh, by just doing in front of your laptop camera, whatever it is that you used to do uh, in, in a hearing room or in a courtroom, right? Because the way, literally the way that the arbitrator perceives you in a Zoom call is very different from if you were in the hearing room. And particularly senior, of course, I mean, mo most advocates, the, the, most of their experience is in physical hearings. They all have their little tricks. They know what works. They know how to draw attention. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you're reduced to this little square on, on somebody's uh, uh, a screen. And it would not be surprising if I tell you that if you've been reduced to a little square on a screen, then you need to do things <clears throat> differently. Otherwise, you're just going to sort of... Um, not be as attention grabbing as you think you are, right? Uh, so uh, make friends with a YouTuber and uh, they will teach you the, the dark arts. But uh, I, I think on my little screen, uh, what, what do I notice? Uh, one is lighting. So uh, it's, it's very difficult to pay attention to someone who, who's speaking, but it's sort of in shadow. I, I can't really uh, uh, make you out, okay? So I think you should buy that O light and get it adjusted until you you are sort of you know lit, uh, not over lit, particularly if not everybody's skin is as good as it should be. Um, but but the other thing I think it's a very common thing and 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 Roderick raised this. It's the background, so you've got to be conscious what's 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 in the background and. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I think we all find ourselves doing it. Uh, if we're watching a speaker on, on, on screen, inevitably, we are staring at one of the shelves because it's much more interesting than, than listening to, 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 to what, 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 what he's got to say. Uh, you know, uh, so you might want a, a, a less distracting uh, background. Uh, and of course, the, the, the easiest thing to do is to go to a virtual black background or to blur your, your background. But, and I think we've also all experienced this, how well your virtual background or blurred background works uh, depends on how fast your, your computer works. And if it's not very fast, then every time you turn your head, you, you get what I call the Astro Boy effect because it sort of bleeds out like, you know, you've developed horns, you know. Uh, uh, so if, 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 if your laptop isn't very fast, maybe just, just put a, you know, a physical something that, that's slightly less uh, uh, distracting. Yeah. Thank you, Casey. Now, speaking of gadgets, aside from the Olight that Casey had endorsed of, um, Sharon, is a professional microphone necessary for the sake of sound clarity in a virtual hearing? Is there a risk of miscommunication? And had there not been one? Uh, well, it, it would certainly be good to have, but I don't think you need a professional microphone, but you do need a, you know, a, a pair of very good um, earbuds or a headset. And um, because otherwise, imagine if I were sound like this, right? So, you know, it, it, it would be horrible. And I think um, one thing I learned very early on um, uh, in, in during the pandemic was that, you know, if you use um, the wired earphones, um, the, you know, when you, when you move your head, you, you know, it actually, your voice actually just goes off. You know, it's almost as though I'm doing this all the time, right? Because, you know, inevitably, we, we do move our heads sometimes when, when we speak. So, have earful, uh, a, a pair of earbuds, um, good ones. And I think there's a difference between those um, that are suitable for music and those that are suitable for calls. Because the, the, the ones that are suitable for calls have um, inbuilt, I mean, they have more inbuilt microphones that will capture um, your, your voice better. Because I mean, through trial and error, I, I, I realized that, you know, all this, um, you know, that there, there is a difference. Um, so headsets, earbuds, um, yeah, and I think um, just following on from um, the discussion about the O light, you know, what I realize is when when we are when we are when we're doing a virtual um, hearing, I don't know whether I'm the only one, but I'm often looking at myself, right? I'm looking at my box because I want to see what I look like, which is why I suppose Zoom is 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 probably my favorite uh, virtual platform because um, you know it. it 
you, you, you see your own uh, box and it's not hovering somewhere, you know. I, I think Teams previously or, or WebEx um, previously didn't have that feature where you could put your own box in the gallery. Um, so yes, and, and one other thing that we have to take note of is that what we see, um, the box uh, with our image may not necessarily be what the other party looks at. Because when you look at your own box, you may think like, oh, I look quite good, you know, it's, it's HD, but really it depends on the, the speed, right? So always test it out and check with your, you know, your colleague, you know, to see what you actually look like. Because you may think that you look very good um, on your own computer, on your own screen, but you actually don't. <laughs> so that's when, you know, you, you have to up your, your game and buy that old light. Thank you, Sharon. Now for the final quick fire round. Where are my air miles? Will in-person hearings go back to being the norm? Um, Casey, given the easy accessibility and convenience of the remote or virtual hearing, do you think that public are ready to resume physical hearing? I, well, it depends who, who are the public, you see. It, it's always safe to shout power to the people. We haven't defined who people are. Uh, I. I, I, I think in reality, I, I can say two things quite safely, I think. I think firstly, Zoom hearings are here to stay in the sense that once the pandemic is over, we're not going to go back to the, the pre-pandemic situation where it's just taken for granted that everybody will jump on airplanes and rendezvous uh, in London or Hong Kong or Singapore or whatever or Geneva and do this hearing. I, I think that assumption is is out of the window in the sense that uh, virtual will be a good proportion of, of arbitrations. Uh, but whether uh, we will continue to have physical hearings uh, really depends uh, on the most senior of the arbitrators, right? Technology always moves at the speed of the most senior person in the room. Is, is, is. Um, what, what I can say is, <clears throat> And I've asked this question of a lot of different people in, in, in arbitration. There is a, a quite strong feeling. I do not say whether I agree with this feeling or not, but there is quite a strong feeling that if witnesses are going to be cross-examined, uh, people prefer physical hearings. They, they prefer that cross-examination happens in a, a physical uh, hearing. That I, I, I do see that. Um, the other preference that I see is uh, when it comes to a virtual, th there are various ways you could do it, right down to one extreme, which is every single person is, in this arbitration is dialing from somewhere else. What, what, what I see more sort of acceptance for is the tribunal all together in one place, and then one, one, one side, uh, lawyers and, and clients are all in another place, and in the other side, lawyers and clients are all in the other place. So you only just have three, three places, uh, uh, darling. And that, that seems to be the more popular model for virtual. Yeah. Thank you, Casey. Now, aside from what Casey had mentioned, the imperativeness of physical hearing in cross-examining witnesses, um, one, of, one major advantage of physical or traditional hearing is that it affords a sense of human touch. Now, Sharon, in your experience, in what way do you think that virtual hearing could provide the same? Um, I think one of the things that I miss most about um, in-person um, hearings is that um, it's really the, the casual um, greetings and chats that um, parties or council and tribunal have you know, before the start of the proceedings and during breaks. And I think that really, um, you know, that really breaks the ice and, and you know, put everyone at ease a little bit. Um, and, and I think that that is quite, that, that makes it a bit more conducive in, in the hearing room. So of course, I mean, we, we, we fight our cases, but you know, we don't, have, we're not enemies, right? So, um, and, I, and I see that lacking in, in a virtual setting, because what we do, we, what we tend to do is we, everyone dial in, you know, at a particular time and, and, and then you start the proceedings and there's no, you know, perhaps there'll be the, oh, hello, how are you? But, but it's just, 
it is really it's been cut short and and because of that you know you, you don't actually get to know your your opponents you don't actually get to know the tribunal better and especially with opponents um you know counsel is important to have that sort of more personal um at least to get to know each other better so that it helps with the entire process right you know when when you want to ask for adjournments when you ask want to ask for some some flexibility with with um with um you know timelines and with you know anything in, in it to do with the proceedings. So that's something that I find that's lacking. Um, so what I do and I actively and, and I, I make it a habit to do is I, I dial in earlier and, and I try to get people kind of, you know, um, dial, to dial in earlier before the tribunal comes in and, and to at least exchange some, some greetings. And, and I think that really helps to, to build that kind of relationship, which is quite important. And I think in Malaysia, in, in, in Malaysia, in Asia, uh, we do have that sort of, um, I mean, we, we are quite um, friendly generally uh, with, our, with our opponents, with, with the other side's counsel um, outside of the, of the hearing. Um, so I, I, I like to maintain that, which is why I, I make it a habit to, 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 to do that, um, you know, to sort of maintain some sort of um, semblance of uh, in-person hearing. Thank you, Sharon. Now, Roderick, in the premise of virtual hearings, with the digitalization of documents, do you think that references to documentary evidence during virtual hearings are made easier? The whole question of digitalization is, uh, uh, is, a, is, a, is a difficult one. Um, first of all, of course, if you've got a virtual hearing, people are in multiple places and they're using paper. Nobody necessarily knows that everybody is looking at the same page. But that's true of an in-person hearing as well. And I think we must resist the temptation to turn the hearing into, as it were, a lecture or a classroom. Has everybody got page five? Good. Now let's all look at it on the blackboard. Uh, and that's not what it should be about. So digitalization, I think, uh, is not necessarily about everyone looking at the same thing at the same time. Footnote, what I do like is arguments about contractual construction. I'm just about to contradict myself. Arguments about contractual construction where you've got clause 12A on the screen and everyone is looking at it. But that's a rarity because then you can get your pointer or you can just take them through and everyone can look at the same words. But even that, at the end of the day, we've had arguments on contractual construction in the paper world for years. And if the arbitrator is not reading the clause, well, that's that's a problem. But digitalization won't necessarily cure it. So that's a view from the council arbitrator angle. But let's spare a thought for the witnesses. And this is something I've worked out for myself, but I've also had confirmed by witnesses, particularly experts who long for the return to the days of the paper bundle, because we cross-examiners cross can, I know this will be a shock to you, be a bit naughty. And we don't necessarily put all the pieces of paper to the witness. We put the best one just uh, can we just have uh, and you talk to the technician uh, or wh whoever it is that's in charge of the bundle can we have page five three four uh just take a moment to read that um surely that shows x y and z and the witness is looking at it and if it's paper the witness can turn to the next page and just peruse a bit and uh etc which is tradition but if it's just on the screen, on one of the four screens, I'll just come back to those in a moment. Uh, if it's on the screen, the witness is completely in the power of the cross-examiner. Of course, it's then, if I'm listening, it's my witness being cross-examined, it's for me in re-examination to take the witness back to that question, to say, actually, just turn the page. Does what you see there affect your answer in any way? And hopefully the witness will, ah, yes, this is what I was looking for. So it can be a, a bit of a straitjacket. And just as an aside, 
how many screens does one need? I think four is the minimum, really. Five if you want to watch the television at the same time. But you've obviously got the screen with the faces. Then you've got the screen with the live note or transcript. Then you've got the screen with the documents. So that's three. Then you've got the screen uh, you know, like this, your, your iPad or whatever, with the WhatsApp group, which is your dialogue with your team who are sending you messages like, why did you say that? And uh, no, thank God, but uh, sending you messages, et cetera. And indeed, I'm quite shameless now. Uh, I, I say to the, to the judge or the arbitrator who's asked a question, just a moment, uh, I, I've, I'm waiting for the WhatsApp. It's the yellow sticky of old. And four screens is, is too many for, for my brain at any rate. But even there, um, in the arbitration room, as we know, forget the WhatsApp, although it might become useful in the arbitration room, you've got three screens and uh, you, you have got uh, that forest of screens now. If you go into a modern arbitration room, you can't see anybody. The arbitrators are looking at the transcript coming up on the live note, not at the fact that the witness has just flushed deep red at an answer which he or she knows is untrue. And sometimes you have to say to the arbitrators, could you please look at the witness for a moment? So, but that's the world we live in and we can't go backwards. Uh, but uh, digitization is a mixed blessing. Right, thank you, Roderick. Now, thank you speakers for your interesting and practical insights on the quick fire topics. Now we would like to open the floor for any questions. And if you have any, whether if it's in joint venture or even fashion tips, kindly raise your hand and we'll extend our microphone to you.